Hi, folks. Thanks for joining us. How you doing? So, uh, we think that people will be filtering in after lunch. Um, <laughs> can you hear us okay? Wonderful. So thank you for joining us for this afternoon session on Opportunity Zones, um, Market or Mirage. Um, how many of you um, have experience with Opportunity Zones, know what Opportunity Zones are? Pretty much everyone, right? Almost everyone? Um, I'll give a, a couple of opening contextualizing remarks, uh, but uh, just to level set, this is not a one-on-one -on, -one on Opportunity Zones. Um, I'm Fran Siegel, Executive Director of the U.S. Impact Investing Alliance, which is a field-building organization focused on impact investing. Um, one of the ways we work, um, one of our work streams is focused on federal policy, uh, so what we call private capital for public good, working with uh, members of the administration, working with uh, regulators and legislators to think about ways to catalyze private capital uh, for, for public sector outcomes. And uh, we got involved with Opportunity Zones relatively early. Jim Sorensen is on the Alliance's board and he introduced us to Economic Innovation Group, uh, the, the, uh, the folks that developed the Investing in Opportunity Act, which became Opportunity Zones in the 2017 tax bill. Um, and we recognized early on that if it were to pass, it would be the first, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> First community investment incentive in the last 15 years since New Markets tax credits and felt like a kind of once in a generation opportunity to really um, make an impact. Uh, we have been very focused, laser focused on uh, the issue of access to data, um, accountability, transparency, and community engagement as a path to community outcomes, which we believe is legislative intent, that is, community economic development. Um, most recently, and uh, perhaps most significantly, we partnered with the New York Federal Reserve Bank um, and uh, the Beck Center at Georgetown, thanks to uh, some grant support from the Rockefeller Foundation, um, to develop an Opportunity Zone reporting framework, which is a private sector framework uh, that we are asking um, fund managers, communities, and other constituencies to use. And at the, at the nucleus, at the center, is managing impact around communities. Um, and so, excited to potentially talk about that um, in a little bit. So I'm joined by four expert panelists. I feel so fortunate to, to, to be working <laughs> with you all and to be speaking with you all. Um, I'm just going to say your name and say your impressive title and then we'll get to, to work and discussion. So to my immediate left, your right, is Otis Rowley, Managing Director, Economic Resilience and Operations and the U.S. Jobs and Economic Opportunity Initiative at Rockefeller Foundation. I'm going to give it a little air because that's like a heavy title <laughs> <laughs> and it's a heavy job and he, he, it, it, it's, it's great to be working with you. Likewise. Um, Jaron Smith, um, Director of Urban Affairs and Revitalization, the Executive Office of the President. That is actually your, not your right title, so I'm going to ask okay. you to say it. Can you say <laughs> it in all of us? Um, well, Deputy Assistant to the President uh, and Deputy Director for the Office of American Innovation. Yes, yes, great. And so um, thank you for being here. Lisa Woods, Managing Director of KPMG, and Jim Sorensen, who, among many other things, is the President of the Sorensen Impact Foundation and the benefactor of the Sorensen Impact Center at the University of Utah. So I'd love to start with you, Jerome, and do what we're calling the Washington Lightning Round. So okay. thank you for coming. <laughs> Red <saw> Eye, <laughs> you're, you're on the road um, going to, to other cities, and we're so excited and, and grateful to have you here. And you've been so instrumental in working with communities, working with um, you know, the White House, and working with members of the administration um, around Opportunity Zones. And the first question I'd like to ask you, which is completely unfair, but I'll ask it anyway, because it's okay. a burning question for all of us, and that is, um, when can we expect the final <laughs> rules and regulations <laughs> sure. around Opportunity ah. Zones? <laughs> um, so the, as you probably know, regulations are in a kind of state of becoming. It's been tranched. And, um, we have been waiting for final regulation, and especially insofar as it relates to um, the 
investability around small business. Sure. And so, so can it's you get out a, your crystal ball? Uh, well, a little bit. I can't give too much information, of course. Um, and I, I answer this question uh, pretty often as soon. You know, we're going to try to get them out as <laughs> soon as possible. Um, hopefully before the end of the year. We know uh, the end of the year is really important for Opportunity Zones. Um, but it's, it's been a process because it's been important uh, for uh, the White House and Treasury uh, to thread the needle for congressional intent. And so we took uh, time to get information back from the marketplace. And I'm happy to say that that's really helped with us finalizing the rules. Uh, we've just started really engaging with Treasury on, on that final tranche. And I feel very optimistic about um, the results and we're trying to get that out um, as soon as possible and hopefully before the end of the year. Okay, that's, that's exciting. And um, of course, as you know, this, this group and, and others um, feel that it's really important to set a national standard for, for reporting, for impact reporting. Sure. And um, some of us, and certainly the Alliance, has been active uh, writing public comment letters, uh, testifying uh, for an IRS and Treasury panel trying to make the case. And sure. many others in our field have tried to make the case. So excited to see those come out. Um, can you speak a little bit about the White House um, Opportunity and Revitalization Council? We were joking earlier that you that we that I'm going to make you a, an Opportunity Zone concert T-shirt <laughs> with all the, awesome. the the communities and cities that you have visited. Sure. Um, and so, can you talk a little bit about the council and the, to. the tour that you've been sure. on, and, and Scott Turner and others have been on? So we we have a team. We've amassed a, a team of um, experts uh, from. Uh, so the, the White House Opportunity Revitalization Council, what it does is take uh, all the different uh, economic development and community development tools throughout the federal government and targets them into opportunity zones so that we can do two things. One, uh, show the federal government's commitment to the social impact of uh, economic impact projects that are on the ground, but also to encourage uh, state uh, and city localities to also design a strategy or use their resources and tools uh, to create that social impact on, gr on the ground. And so we've looked at all of our, uh, um, like I said before, economic development tools as well as our safe community tools. Um, that's everything from mentoring to gang prevention to uh, drug prevention programs uh, to everything from entrepreneurship uh, development and workforce development. And so those tools are all located on our website, opportunityzones.gov. Um, you can look at the 160 agency actions. And um, myself, I've been to almost 15 or 20 different cities. Um, Scott Turner's um, upwards of like 50. And uh, we got a lot of great in, um, insight from localities. And what we're working to do now is uh, start to use our platform to build partnerships and do workshops to help individuals on the ground and in the community uh, leverage the tool uh, to help uh, empower those communities. Um, workshops that would deal with entrepreneurship uh, training to be marketable for equity investment uh, or uh, technical assistance for some of our community development tools and also for local leaders, uh, what, what does deals look like? You know, and we did a, recently did a summit in Mississippi, Jackson, Mississippi with Milken um, and we spent a day just going over deal flow uh, because, um, you know, many of our major cities get involved in many of those different things, but our rural economies uh, don't always have those resources. And so we're, we're uh, looking to put out more information, a toolkit uh, through a couple different key agencies such as HUD um, and um, EDA, Economic, Economic Development Administration under Commerce. And so you'll, you'll be able to capture all of that activity on opportunityzones.gov. Mm -hmm. I should have bought that URL. I could have done some arbitrage. Oh yeah, amen. <laughs> I should have seen that coming, Jerron. <laughs> right. Great, well thank you. I look forward to, to, to hearing more in a moment. Okay. Um, Jim, I'd love to turn to you. Um, and you wear a number of different hats in the Opportunity Zone space and indeed in the impact investing space. Um, you are, um, in addition to being the president of the Sorensen Impact Foundation, you're also raising an opportunity fund. So you're also a fund manager, as well as an investor in funds. And so wondering if you could talk a little bit about what your experience has been to date in raising an impact fund, an, an opportunity fund, and um, uh, if what, the, what kind of deal flow you're seeing um, sure. 
for the for this fund. You'll be happy to. Um, you know, I think there have been a few challenges that um, uh, we've had to face, and others have faced in in raising an opportunity zone fund. Um, maybe I'll talk a little bit about those, and then I think some of the opportunities, and I think positive aspects that we're experiencing. Um, you know, I think in, in, the biggest challenge I think has been kind of the slow and complex nature of the regulations. Uh, and we're really hoping that we get all of them out uh, by the end of the year. I think it uh, will really help things to move uh, along. Um, I think the other aspect is that the regs are really not consistent with uh, traditional commercial practices in terms of you know, how fund structures are set up and uh, you know, how the financial markets understand uh, investing in funds and so forth. So there's, there's a learning curve for investors as well as uh, really even the, the, the wirehouses that uh, will put you know, investments like this onto their platform uh, that it takes more time. Um, I think the market's a little fragmented uh, because it's a, it's a non-traditional, more uh, difficult uh, process. And <clears throat> you know, lining up uh, investments with investor needs in terms of their, their gains and the timing around those gains and, and their preferences. Um, and of course, the illiquidity is something that is different for many investors. You know, they're typically used to shorter time horizons. Um, so these are some of the challenges that I think um, that you, you face. Um, with Catalyst, um, we're a very intentional uh, double bottom line fund that's committed to competitive returns alongside measurable social impact. And I think uh, one of the things that I think has been heartening to me is that that uh, thesis of impact alongside investment has really resonated with investors that are more traditional in their investment uh, um, you know, practices in the past. Uh, I remember a dinner that we had with an investor that probably was going to be about a, uh, an hour-long dinner, um, and we talked about, uh, you know, the kind of the tax arbitrage and the, the uh, you know, investment uh, potential. But then we got into the impact side, and that really took over the conversation. And uh, this investor really um, identified you know, with his own hometown, with issues that we were talking about. And they resonated with him. And this notion of being able to, you know, help uh, a community alongside, uh, you know, a, 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 a market rate return really, uh, I think, was the reason that uh, this investor decided to invest in, uh, you know, this uh, new fund that, that was investing in Opportunity Zones. We have uh, also, I think, found, uh, uh, surprisingly, um, a, a number of like-minded partners and developers that share the same ethos that we have. So that's part of our sourcing strategy. We look for developers that, that have been in communities, that are committed communities, that uh, are really also committed to sustainable investing, uh, and feel like uh, you know those kind of partnerships are going to be necessary to be able to uh, be successful in generating impact alongside the investment, and then also the community engagement is is a huge piece that uh, that we look at, and then um, I think we're finding really good opportunities um, in kind of the heartland uh, areas in in. And, and that's really what I think this legislation was intended to do, was to really motivate capital to be able to be flowing into undercapitalized communities. Communities, uh, you know, like Louisville and, and Nashville and, and Columbus and, and Tacoma, um, you know, we have a pipeline of about 50 uh, deals at this point that represent about a billion dollars in, in potential investments that uh, give us great encouragement that the deal flow is there and that communities in particular that are proactive um, are really playing a role to bring to the forefront. 
um, we take a very measured approach in, in our impact. We have about 20 different databases that we look at in these communities, everything from income levels to housing to access to services that uh, inform ultimately what uh, impact we can generate and measure over time. Um, and uh, I, th I think there's a tremendous opportunity with this program to be able to address uh, you know, the needs and opportunities within these distressed communities. Jim, can you talk a little bit about the, the nature of the deal flow? Are you looking at certain kinds of real estate development, housing? What, what, what constitutes it? You talked about 50 deals and the potential deals in the pipeline. What, are, what does that pipeline look like? They vary. So uh, in, in uh, some cases, uh, there's a need for more affordable housing and uh, we find developers that have, I think, innovative approaches to that um, in, in maybe a co-living uh, uh, model in, in some cases. Um, we look at others that may have food deserts or um, they really don't have a good uh, health provider. Uh, and, you know, the development is programming in those kind of uh, uh, tenants. Um, we see the opportunity for uh, you know, education in charter schools and so forth. It really comes down to a mix and it comes down to really the needs within the community. Now, I think there are themes in other uh, areas of impact that, um, such as infrastructure, uh, even clean energy, um, uh, you know, we have not focused so much in those areas, but more uh, in the traditional uh, needs of, of uh, you know, distressed communities. Thank you. Um, Otis, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about how foundations um, can help influence the market. Um, Rockefeller Foundation and Kresge Foundation were among the first national foundations to see this unique opportunity um, in opportunity zones, to understand fundamentally that there is a window in which to shape the market, especially as the regulatory uh, framework sharpened up. Um, and was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, what led you to uh, announce these six cities that you have invested in, um, the Opportunity Zone Academy, and just can you talk about the strategy and the, the role that Rockefeller Foundation is playing as a national philanthropy? Sure. Um, I, I really appreciated the title for the panel in terms of market or mirage, um, and particularly because the way that the tax credit was established, I felt the foundation felt that it was doing a lot um, in terms of the tax credit to really help to create that market. Um, uh, but in many ways, it would have been and could have been just a mirage, though, for the community residents in the qualified opportunity zones, where you see a future ahead of you, um, where a, a community that had been historically uh, disinvested in both by the public and private sector, um, having a chance to have all this capital come in and a better future, but it's a mirage because you can't really uh, realize that that uh, new opportunity. Um, and and Understanding that, the foundation thought it was crucial for us to kind of step in and step up uh, and try to effect change in that regard so that it is both um, a market for, uh, for investors as well as those who have been long-term investors uh, and stayed in those communities um, through the good times and, and the bad times. Uh, and so for us, it is it's 13 cities, um, both the six cities that we are doing the, uh, um, the community capacity building initiative as well as the seven cities um, by which we're doing the Opportunity Zone Academy. Um, and we see this work as something that is replicable um, and, uh, and that we're trying to encourage other foundations and other um, like-minded individuals and organizations to do the same type of work to really invest deeply in the communities and the cities so that they are coming uh, to the table with the resources that many of the investors have. Um, we think that uh, the community and the cities should know um, the, the complicated um, components of a deal. They should have an understanding of the tax regs. They can and should um, have the wherewithal to negotiate in the best interest of the community and of the city. And often that's not, that's not going to just happen. Uh, the, 
Um, and the, the best way for that to occur is for the cities and the communities to be able to, uh, to have the resources brought to bear to do that. And so we've invested in, um, in these 13 cities, partnered with um, some phenomenal organizations um, with LISC and BCT Partners, Cities of Service, Smart Growth America, Locus, um, all around how do we bring the technical assistance, human resources, um, to the cities and, and communities. And our chief opportunity zone officers that we're, we're funding in, in six of those cities, we, we have worked with the cities to, that they could look for and hire individuals who are as masterful negotiating with billionaires at the mahogany uh, boardroom table as they are negotiating in a, a storefront church basement um, with Mrs. Jenkins, right? And I think um, because Mrs. Jenkins is as important as the billionaire, right? And, uh, and so for, for this work to matter and for the opportunity zones to truly bring the opportunity that we think they can, we thought it was crucial for us to, to make this investment. And, and we're hoping to not be the only ones to do it. We, we see others doing it uh, elsewhere. Um, in many ways, the model for the COZOs came from the ABLE Foundation's investment in Baltimore. Um, and so we're learning and growing um, and hoping to push out information so that others can do the same so that it's not a mirage. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, yeah, so Baltimore has a, 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 I don't know if Ben is called a chief opportunity zone officer, but he talks, um, talks about himself as sort of a matchmaker, where he is identifying community assets, community needs, community priorities, and really matching them, uh, and, and identifying deals, and then matching it with uh, fund managers. And in the early days of the, of the uh, of, of the opportunity zones, there was just this fundamental gap. It was really clear that um, in, in cit that cities lacked uh, some of the resources and the expertise base to have the conversations with the catalyst funds of the world and others, right? I mean, Jim it runs uh, an impact opportunity fund, uh, but there are plenty of uh, opportunity funds that are run by incumbent real estate developers. And so understanding how to hold your own with, with some of those folks, uh, with the gyms of the world, but also you know, some other folks that maybe uh, uh, where, where it's important to assert the community's priorities. Yes, completely. I think many of the cities that we, we are investing in and just throughout the United States, the, the level of expertise that you need um, to negotiate these deals, many of the cities have economic development authorities, economic development corporations, um, community development corporations where that expertise is there. But let's be frank, they never, they've often not had the incentive to do this work in those distressed areas. Um, I would argue that the intelligence, the skill sets, the expertise, the experience that you need to do a deal um, in a distressed area is not very different than, the, the, than those skills that you need to do the deal um, in a hot market uh, area. It's just not the incentive. The, the mayors or chief executives often are eager for the ribbon cuttings and the ground breakings, and God bless them, those are wonderful things. Um, but, and those things happen more frequently in the hot areas than in those distressed areas. Um, and so the argument that they didn't necessarily have the resources in many, particularly the larger cities, is not necessarily true. Um, uh, the, where there was a lack of expertise, though, was really around how you apply those skill sets to those distressed areas, right? Um, and where there was a lack of knowledge, even for people who were subject matter experts in their city, they often did not spend a lot of time, energy, and effort in, in those uh, uh, more distressed areas because they were historically disinvested in, um, both by the public and private sector and often ignored by, uh, by both, both sectors. And so what was really attractive to us about this, this legislation was to bring that attention to these 8,700 plus right, uh, distressed areas. Um, and then any role that we could play and that we're trying to play in terms of our grant making um, and investing to really bring the attention to those areas and then to add um, some fuel uh, to the fire in terms of having some individuals who, who did know those areas uh, and were willing to apply those resources and those skill sets that they've, that they've used elsewhere in these, in these distressed communities. And we're, and we're seeing some, um, some uh, proof of, uh, that this is working already and it's, it's very early. Many of our COSOs are just coming on board um, and we're eager to really try to put in uh, infrastructure so that we can start capturing, measuring, um, and reporting out on, on what we're seeing both in terms of success and, and failure, so we can learn, learn from both. 
Uh, Otis touched on something that's, that's important around um, the uh, interest around opportunity zones, the reporting around opportunity zones really captured the imagination of a lot of different folks and um, put a spotlight on community investing and disinvested and underinvested communities. Of course, this community, our community, has a lot of experience investing in these uh, and these areas, both rural and urban, and um, using the, the, the bright spotlight of opportunity zones to talk in a fulsome way about what it means to invest in communities is, a, seems like a very unique opportunity that uh, we're working on. And so while opportunity zones is an equity tool, there's Community Reinvestment Act money, there's new markets tax credits, there's grants, there's philanthropies or more philanthropies need to step up, community foundations need to step up. Um, and um, it, it, it feels like a kind of a unique moment for us um, as a field and for those of us that, that, that care about bringing economic vitality back to communities. So Lisa. You work at KPMG, mm -hmm. I do. and my understanding <laughs> is that you that there I admit are it. <laughs> 150 folks in across the firm, across the country, engaged in opportunity zones, and that you are the ringleader of this group. And um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about what draws you to this work. Um, what does KPMG as a firm, um, from a kind of practice perspective, bring to the table? And if you can give us an example of a community that you've observed uh, that has been doing some interesting, uh, albeit like early work, around Opportunity Zones. Um, yeah, so I am one of the national leaders of the Opportunity Zone practice at KPMG, which is a motley crew of tax, audit, and advisory folks from all over the country that are doing something with Opportunity Zones. My particular focus is on impact, and what's really exciting to build on what you said is that I'm getting in front of clients that I would have never gotten in front of to have a conversation about impact mm. because of Opportunity Zones. Um, and so I'm really hoping that this sort of opportunity zone interest pushes impact investing more into the conversation more often um, because of that interest. Um, so, so I am seeing a lot of that. Um, I have the pleasure um, of working with a lot of really interesting clients on this. Um, one of them is Erie, uh, Pennsylvania. I work for, uh, with the Erie Downtown Development Corporation. And if you um, don't know what's going on in Erie, it's definitely um, something to look up and a story um, to know. I think that the positive narratives and the bright spots and sort of the islands of good out there need to be kind of talked about and those narratives have to be repeated and the models have to be replicated. So um, eddc.org is a good place to get information about it. Erie was, I think, the first place to come out with an investment prospectus um, with Bruce Katz and um, they have since just trailblazed this and in the poorest zip code in the nation, um, which is downtown Erie, they have already attracted more than uh, $90 million of investment, which is pretty incredible. And to me, it's a story that shows that this is working exactly how it was intended to um, in a place that really fits that traditionally disinvested uh, definition. And the $90 million, some of it came, $50 million, I believe, came from a local insurance company. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about where that money came from in this very, very dis disinvested yeah. uh, census tract? So I, I can't talk about the whole capital stack, but, um, but I can talk about Erie Insurance because they, they made their, um, their investment public. Um, so they, um, they're a really interesting company. They have been philanthropic for their whole existence and, and do a lot um, very quietly around Erie um, that, that has great impact. Um, they, they decided before Opportunity Zones even were part of the tax law and were in the picture to fund, uh, partially fund this um, downtown development corporation um, and, and just coincided luckily with the establishment of the Opportunity Zones. Um, it, they felt very strongly um, that it was important for them to invest in their community and to be an anchor institution and, and really help align the various stakeholders in the community around a specific objective and strategy and thereby projecting confidence for 
other investors from outside of Erie. And what's interesting is that they're not investing in the Opportunity Zone for that 10-year payout, specifically. Um, they're investing because they are getting um, a different kind of impact. They're growing really, really quickly, and they need to hire about 600 people a year. Um, and they need to attract that talent to Erie, Pennsylvania. So it's in their best interest, and they understand that it's in their best interest to revitalize that community so that the best talent wants to come and stay in Erie. So I think that's a conversation that you can have with um, corporate anchor institutions or potential anchor institutions where they can see a value that far exceeds what their monetary return would be. And, and Lisa, you talked about working with different types of clients around impact. What kind of tools or frameworks do you use to help folks that may be new to impact um, and uh, motivated around impact because of opportunity zones? How do you help them think about impact? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's great when a client comes and says, you know, um, we can spend a lot of money on this, it's okay that it's not a requirement, but we feel like it's really personally important or the market is asking for us to be really very specific and intentional around impact, that's fantastic. But to be honest, it doesn't happen a lot. So our ability to fall back on things like the Oz reporting framework, um, you know, is really important because we're able to provide even those clients that don't have a budget to spend on on impact and impact strategy and reporting, we're able to provide them with, a, you know, sort of a, a way to do it on their own, um, sort of a, a self a self help um, guide to impact. So I, I've seen it, you know, all the way from just here. Here's the link to the Oz reporting framework. Do this um, to you know developing a full blown, um, you know, bespoke strategy and, and reporting methodology. Great, thank you. Um, so. Jim, I want to ask you one last question, um, uh, specifically around the Opportunity Zone Catalyst Challenge, if you feel like you can talk about it. Um, could you describe what the Catalyst Challenge is, what the objectives of it are, and if there are any uh, early indications you can share about the applicant pool? Sure. Um, a little bit about the, uh, and we call it the Forbes uh, Opportunity Zone Challenge, because Forbes is our partner. Forbes is really good at lists. So uh, the purpose behind this um, was really to identify, spot, recognize, spotlight, and hopefully disseminate best practices and innovation uh, of really the top funds as well as the top uh, communities. And we had a, a fairly lengthy application process this year that uh, was set out to uh, a whole host of interested parties, and and uh, we just have recently gotten the results back. And I, I think this is an encouraging data set. Uh, keep in mind that it's not comprehensive; it's it's uh, self-reported. And um, uh, obviously, I think those that um, are more oriented towards impact are probably uh, reporting. Uh, but I think it's really encouraging. Um, I can give you just kind of some highlights of the results. Um, we had about 120 applications that boiled down to about 113 that uh, were scored, and they totaled about 15.2 billion in potential uh, investments into Opportunity Zones. There were 62 funds that submitted and 51 communities that applied. And again, it was a very rigorous uh, application. Um, the funds uh, listed as priority in terms of their uh, um, geographies, 85% were focused in urban areas, 50% in, in rural, and 39% in suburban. So it was good to see uh, rural communities that uh, were strongly represented. Um, and then 16% of the funds intend to invest in businesses. And I think that kind of reflects kind of a lagging of the, the business regs that hopefully come out by the end of the year <laughs> and remove some of the, some of the uh, concerns or ambiguities as it relates to investing in small businesses. Um, in terms of the areas of focus, 
Uh, interestingly, about 75%, um, you know, were focused on encouraging small businesses. That, that doesn't mean they were investing in, in small businesses, but in real estate that would encourage uh, small business formation. 71% uh, housing, about 60% environment, um, 65% uh, had a strong focus on racial equity, um, about 52% education, 47% uh, uh, gender equity, and about 44% were in transportation. Um, as it relates to the communities, we had about uh, 1,400 projects, prospective projects, that uh, were reported by the 51 communities. So there are multiple projects uh, in many of these com communities. 86% of these communities have at least one shovel-ready project, which I think is encouraging to know that uh, they've gotten to that stage. Um, and they, they report uh, on, uh, there were communities that represented about 24 states. Um, I think of investments that have been made, and there's been about three billion that were reported in terms of investments that had been made. 50% were listed in as commercial investments. Now those may include uh, really housing as well as mixed use, which was 26.5%. 3% were industrial, 3.8% uh, residential, but that's kind of a misnomer because there's residential in some of the other categories and, and about 16% in, in other types of investments. Um, I think anecdotally, um, we were very impressed by uh, some of the very innovative approaches and the collaborative approaches uh, that we saw within these uh, uh, applications. And uh, the, the plan is really to uh, boil this down and, and really summarize the learnings and hopefully be able to inspire, motivate, and inform others as to how to uh, really generate impact and, and uh, financial returns. Great, thank you. Um, I believe that this is the first time you're sharing these high-level data takeaways. Um, we're in the selection process at this time. Um, and uh, what is the timeline for announcing? So it'll be 10 communities and 10 funds. And the idea is really to lift up best practices around impact and community engagement. So into, uh, uh, to lift up best actors as a way of, again, shaping the market. I think in some ways, when you think about all of our work, um, we are seeking to, as impact investors, as folks that care about communities, uh, seeking to shape the market toward uh, community outcomes. We had a rigorous three-hour meeting. Actually, it turned out to be three and a half hours. Fran, you were on that. Uh, uh, you know, advisory committee that is selecting and curating the, the winners. We hope to announce those uh, shortly and then uh, we'll announce the, the finalists, which will be the top two of the communities and top two of the funds at the Winter Innovation Summit in February, the first week in February in Salt Lake Terrific. City. Thank you. Um, would love to open it up to the audience. I have many other questions I can ask the panelists, but thought you might have some as well. Um, are there questions folks want to ask? Yes. Hello. And um, so my question, maybe using the example of the insurance company in Erie, um, how do we make sure that the like the folks in those communities are also participating in the equity gains and into in the jobs essentially that are entering these communities. I can answer that one. So uh, I love the fact that we're all on the same page. <laughs> one theme that a uh, couple themes that you've heard out of this, if you take anything, is one intentionality, you know, collaboration, and two having a strategy, right? And so what we've done as a White House, all of our convenings are uh, very intentional on that social impact piece, which is why it's so important to have some of the local leaders, um, local elected leaders involved, because they have that connectivity to the community. Um, and we've approached them different types of ways. Sometimes it's a council person, um, sometimes it's a congressional person, or sometimes it's the local mayor. But um, they've definitely been a secret ingredient with having that connectivity to the ground um, and offering up 
uh, the community on, on the front end, not on the back end, um, before uh, decisions made, um, getting the community input on what they think is best for their community is an extremely important part of at least what we've done with our convenings. Uh, and we also uh, have um, partnered with folks like Rockefeller who also have, um, or LISC or Enterprise, who also have uh, community connections. Um, but that's, that's the heart, I think, of any type of good social impact project. And I can tell you, um, since I've been involved with Opportunity Zones um, from the beginning, that was really the goal of the legislation, to have a tool that uh, could help empower the community and be mutually beneficial to the investor and the community. Um, but it, it takes those collaborations. It takes being very intentional. And once you have that, then it's developing the right strategy that is mutually beneficial. And I just want to add, sometimes it, it's not obvious. Sometimes it's not linear. So I was right. talking to a client the other day that bought a property in Chester, Pennsylvania that was in an opportunity zone. And he's actually going to um, move some courier businesses that he has onto this property, which thanks to the regulation example about the landscaping business, we understand that he can do. Um, so we need more examples like that. Um, and, you know, he, he was worried that he didn't have an impact narrative with what he was doing because he already has a lot of employees. He's not really bringing new employees in. And so we just started to try to peel the onion back and unravel what he was doing. And it turned out he was doing a couple things that were important, I think, in his narrative. Number one, he worked really closely with architects and others to make sure that where the trucks came in were furthest away from where it would impact where people lived, so it wouldn't be as disruptive. But he also um, reached out to SEPTA, which is the, um, the public transportation, because the, the SEPTA station that was closest to this piece of land was just terrible right, just really in disrepair and awful. And they agreed that if he moved these businesses to Chester, they would rehabilitate this train station, which, you know, isn't really kind of part of his business plan, but certainly is gonna have an incredible positive effect for the whole community. So I think it's, you know, kind of thinking outside the four corners of the, of the deal um, to see the impact as well. I might want to make one other comment, I think, um you know, we take a very intentional, deliberate approach in scoring, as part of our due diligence process, the impact. Uh, so, the affordability as it relates to to uh, housing in, in a project, at it, as as compared to the LMI in the in the community, the access to services, uh, and and we really look for the opportunities that will. Uh, encourage economic development uh, with, within uh, uh, the projects because ultimately, you know, job creation and uh, improvement of incomes for those that live there are key to the success in this program. I would just add, I think ultimately there has to be someone whose job it is uh, to think in the terms that you just articulated, right? That uh, for us, our investment in COZOs is not to just create a deal jockey, right? Or another economic development officer in the city who, who happens to care or focus in on distressed areas. They, they should be in many ways like an expediter at a really good restaurant, right? Their job is not just to, um, for those of you who may have spending time in the service industry, um, it's, you know, it's not just about hurrying and making sure that the food is on the table or just this or just there. It's about the overall experience because if that rocks, right, more people are going to keep coming to the restaurant, the business is going to, and it's the same way that, that COZO should be thinking not just about how do I expedite this deal quickly for the investor, but it should be also about what's the ROI for the community, right? And if they're coming with that level of intentionality and focus both on how you can do well and do good, um, then they're going to navigate that deal in a way where they're consciously and consistently really pulling and pushing in, in regards to that. And that's why the COSO has to have real relationships, um, not just with the bankers and with the investors, but also with the community. They have, and that's why the, the COSO should be uh, someone kind of who is connected to, to the city so that they have that kind of that public 
um, public obligation, almost kind of legal obligation, while also um, having the freedom, and that's why many of our COSOs are connected to the EDCs and the EDAs because they're kind of city employees, but not, right? They have the flexibility and flow um, that they can do um, both acting on behalf of the city, but also on behalf of, of the, the private sector. And so, um, and um, forgive me for going, speaking too long, but it's just, I think that's, that's the only way, and that's why we made that investment in the COSOs. I recognize that we don't have the money to create 10,000 COSOs, right? But that if we set up um, a model that makes sense, that others will fund it, and people will recognize how important it is, but there has to be someone who's thinking about it all day, every day, um, because it's not going to happen organically. It's not going to just happen because we want it to. Um, someone has to be, literally, their paycheck has to depend on it happening. Other questions? Yes, in the front. Um, so, an emphasis on economic development coordinators. Um, and unfortunately, from thousands of opportunity zones, they do not have that resource. The government is cash strapped. They're, they're not going to have someone who can think about that. I'm from one of those communities, and I happen to be a property owner in an opportunity zone. I can tell you over the last year, it's been almost impossible from the um, the person with the property and the idea and, and other resources to find information, advising, and the early money to start doing the work. Because I've talked with private equity and they said, we love the idea, but you need to be shovel ready before we put a dollar in. And to me, that says an interesting thing about um, the risk that, that those who are best off in hard off communities are expected to absorb in order to catch the attention of those in investing in opportunity zones. So I'm wondering, for those who don't have the benefit of an economic development coordinator or somebody really leading the charge, what are good resources for them in terms of organizations, consultancies, or online resources, or even entities that are deciding to be the first money in? Sure. Um, what are those early stage resources that people in my community and thousands of others could take access, get access to before they're at the point of being shovel ready. Sure, so one thing that we uh, just did with our website, um, the, the biggest reason for the website was for smaller communities to find information and having some uh, trusted uh, center to find information not only uh, federally, but uh, having something to direct them to their local uh, resources. And so we have opportunityzones.gov. I mentioned that earlier today. And then I also spoke a little bit about uh, the toolkit that we're using to empower our regional administrators um, or some of the economic development people under EDA, um, which connects to a lot of those uh, development systems um, around the country. And so uh, we're also hoping to host convenings uh, to help uh, um, you know, get information out and um, be the connector to private sector leaders. Of course, uh, from the federal perch, we can't pick winners and losers. And so far as like putting out there who you should connect with, I'll leave these to these folks to say, say some of that and give those recommendations. Um, but we, we've certainly um, thought a lot about that and um, are having a conversation with Congress on how we can appropriately deploy technical assistance because the, the last thing we want is for rural communities to spend uh, a lot of cash on a consultant that um, is just giving them public information um, for the most part. Because with these rules, you know, um, everyone's waiting to see the rules <laughs> finalize, and uh, like I said, end of the year, I think yeah, they're in a good please, place. Can I just make another plea? Not, yeah, not the week before Christmas. Yeah, no, right. not before Christmas. really, that is not a good present. <laughs> no, I, I don't think that would be good. Present. I don't think that would be yeah. good at all. We, um, we, I think we're really close. I, I wish I could tell you more, but I feel confident about it. Uh, but, the, but the thing is, you're right, that like, that 40% of uh, opportunity zones are rural, and we, we understand that, and we've tried to use our platform to kind of get information out to people and host convenings. Um, but also, you know, investors are at different stages too. And so some of the investors you're talking about are talking shovel ready. There's also investors who are looking more longer term. And so um, it's really getting out in that ecosystem. 
I also, I don't know when you spoke to them, but I also think that the second set of regulations did a lot to calm people down about the time limitations a little right. bit. It provided some safe harbor, it provided some breathing room. So people aren't, we're, we're, I'm seeing people less anxious about, oh my gosh, it has to be shovel ready, it has to be ready to go, I can't, you know, I only have a very short time to kind of spend my money. So I think the more education people have and, and the more clear the regulations um, become the, the easier it will be, hopefully, to attract capital at earlier stages. Um, I've got a bunch of information with me that I can give you if you um, find me afterwards, just explaining different parts of, of the regulations. Um, for something that's supposed to be sort of do-it-yourself, it's pretty complicated. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, if, you, you know, if you have a long trip, plane ride and you want something to make you fall asleep, I've got a bunch of stuff with me. <laughs> I also want to say, I think some of uh, the reasons why we're investing in these 13 cities, though, is also to provide information beyond the, the 13 cities, right? So we made some early grant making uh, to the National Governors Association around some of the stuff, recognizing that um, while particularly for our target population in terms of low-wage workers, the vast majority of them are, are in the urban centers, uh, that, you know, opportunity zones are everywhere, right? Uh, and so in many, many jurisdictions, a lot of uh, the economic development work happens at the state level, at the county level, um, because as you as you mentioned, they might not be an EDO or EDA um, in a in a particular town or um, um, uh, uh, area, and so. For, for us, um, where it's our hope and some of our future investments in uh, the very, um, not distant future, but hopefully Q1 um, investments that we're trying to make, also Q1 of 2020, um, that we're trying to make is also around pulling together data hubs, pulling together uh, a real a kind of community of learning so that we can push information out. You know, So um, one of the, the great things in terms of that the administration is doing in terms of the Opportunity Zone um, website and then the investments that uh, HUD made with uh, enterprise community partners in terms of the creation of, of that toolkit um, is phenomenal, right? And that's stuff that you can pull down now. It's there. As we produce our stuff, it won't just be a, a rock of Feller um, endeavor is this is going to be public information that we will put on on the government website, push out um, the the learning, etc. Uh, because we do want to demystify it. Um, I don't, I don't in any way want to shortchange the reality that I do think is reality that there has to be point people, right, um, in whether, whatever context, whether that's a, um, someone at the state level, um, some of the things we've seen in Alabama, uh, where there's a lot of work happening at the state level that is helping in the rural and, and kind of county levels, et cetera. Um, but we want to play uh, a, a role in the investments and in grant making that we're doing in those, in those 13 cities uh, that will allow for learning to get pushed out uh, throughout the country. Great. Well, I'm noticing we have only a couple minutes left, and I was wondering if um, I could ask the panelists to say a call to action to the audience. So uh, this is a highly uh, impact-oriented group. Um, you know, some of you have deep connections to communities, and so if you could issue a call to action to the SOCAP community around specifically opportunity zones, what would it be? And just kind of let's go maybe start with Jim and go down the line. Well, I think it's a unique opportunity. When I looked at uh, the Opportunity legi Zone legislation, I saw it as uh, a moonshot to engage you know, impact investing to more traditionally oriented uh, investors. Uh, but I think the real secret to success is going to be in collaboration. Collaboration of the communities uh, and the, the stakeholders that are there, the, those that, that live there, uh, the local governments, the nonprofits, uh, as well as, as the investment community in helping to uh, innovate and, and be able to uh, address the, the issues that are there. So I think we come from all walks of life, everyone here. I think you should look at how you might be able to contribute towards that collaboration, and that would be my, my call to action with this group. Uh, so for me, it would be um, for everyone to just be as bold and as big a thinker as you can and, and really push yourself to think of more creative ways to leverage this legislation. And, um, you know, if, if you come to us, no matter how crazy the idea, um, if, if, if we feel as though it's, you know, sort of in line with the policy objectives, 
we're going to do our best or go to another trusted advisor, but somebody that's going to do their best to get you where you want to go within the confines of the regulations. Um, but, but don't sit back and watch and then complain next year that you don't like the way that, that this looks because right now is when the market is being formed. Right. Uh, it's funny. I was going to say a combination of the same thing. <laughs> you know, um, one, that intentionality is, is really important. And I mentioned that because I've been in so many communities that's concerned with displacement and things like that. And it's, it's, it's some fear attached to um, what they don't understand with the tool. But the intentionality of it, the communities that have saying, I'm going to take this tool and leverage it to empower my community. We've seen results orient from that versus the latter. Um, we've seen people stand still and no activity. And it's, and it's literally a marketplace. And so that builds into the other piece of collaboration. Um, figure out, you know, what it is that uh, you're trying to transform, you know, develop a strategy and then get into that ecosystem, that partnership, because it exists around you, um, rather you know it or not. I've always said it's the federal, state, local government, and then it's the private sector, and the private sector includes foundations, investors, um, big companies, nonprofits, um, as well as uh, um, faith-based institutions. And then that all impacts the fifth partner, which is the individual who needs um, access to capital to start a business or the individual that wants to get on the ladder of opportunity um, with a job or, or workforce. And so um, with that collaboration, I think we can create that social impact, but it's, it's, it's going to be different in every locality. And uh, it, it really starts with being very intentional and figuring out how you can leverage the tool. So. Well, I only have 10 seconds, so I'm going to say this. <laughs> Invest in that fifth partner. Yeah. Invest in that fifth partner. Take all of your dollars and your resources. It was the local, state, federal um, decisions, policies that, that disinvested, made decisions to, to break down those 8,700 districts. Um, and it was the private sector that made conscious decisions to not invest. Um, and so now let's flip it. Let's be as intentional in investing in that fifth partner, in those individuals, giving them the capacity um, and, the, and the resources that they need and, and true partnerships not just engagement, don't just ask their opinion or their thoughts, um, but a partnership, recognize their power, recognize the investment that they made um, and the staying power that they had in, in those communities and invest in them in a serious and substantial way. Great, great way to end. Thank you so much to the panelists. Thank you. Thanks so much,